Sometimes you, you sing words that maybe you've just not noticed in the same way before, but verse 2 hit me in a way I've not ever experienced that I can remember singing this hymn. I found a friend, or oh, such a friend, he bled. He died to save me. I'm not alone the gift of life, but His own self He gave me. Not that I have my own I call. I hold it for the giver. My heart, my strength, my life, my all are His, and His forever. Sometimes I wonder if we really think about what it is that we sing and we say and we read and we hear. Someone died for us, and not any ordinary one, but God made flesh, and we can call him a friend. <sighs> Boggles the mind. John 15, John 15. We are just taking a little detour over recent weeks, looking at other themes and different things. Not, it wasn't intentional, it's just how things have really worked out. And uh, where my heart has been, this keeps being directed to various things. So that is the case tonight. We will resume our study and look eventually. I'll not make any promises that it will be next week, but we will get there. Don't I'm not going to abandon ship in chapter 19. <laughs> Having gone so far, we will make our way to the very end. And same for Hebrews in the morning also. Let's take time to read this tremendous chapter. Our Lord Jesus has the eleven before him and is edifying them, strengthening them, giving courage to them. If ever there was a proof of the fact that we need the Word at all times, and we need the Word especially in time of trial, and that in time of trial the Lord prepares us by giving us His Word, even sometimes uh, preempting the trial by building us up so that we're stronger in what we're about to face. If there's ever evidence of that, it's John 14, 15, and 16. And the Lord knows that His disciples are going to really struggle with what's about to occur. He knows that. Um, he tries to encourage, uh, he instills in them that let not your hearts be troubled, don't be anxious, but he is addressing a reality that they are tending toward that, that feeling of anxiety and trouble and unrest as he makes his way to the cross. And so he speaks to them densely in a profound way in these chapters that mercifully God has given to us by his Spirit in the Gospel of John. So let us read the opening verses of chapter 15, John 15, verse 1. I am the true vine, and my Father is the husbandman. Every branch in me that beareth not fruit he taketh away, and every branch that beareth fruit he purgeth it, that it may bring forth more fruit. Now ye are clean through the word which I have spoken unto you. Abide in me, and I in you. As the branch cannot bear fruit of itself, except it abide in the vine. No more can ye, except ye abide in me. I am the vine, ye are the branches. He that abideth in me, and I in him, the same bringeth forth much fruit. For without me ye can do nothing. If a man abide not in me, he is cast forth as a branch, and is withered. And men gather them, and cast them into the fire, and they are burned. If ye abide in me, and my words abide in you, ye shall ask what ye will, and it shall be done unto you. Herein is my Father glorified, that ye bear much fruit, so shall ye be my disciples. As the Father hath loved me, so have I loved you. Continue ye in my love. If ye keep my commandments, ye shall abide in my love, even as I have kept my Father's commandments, and abide in his love. These things have I spoken unto you, that my joy might remain in you, and that your joy might be full. 
This is my commandment, that ye love one another as I have loved you. Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. Hear, my friends, if ye do whatsoever I command you. Henceforth I call you not servants, for the servant knoweth not what his Lord doeth, but I have called you friends, for all things that I have heard of my Father I have made known unto you. Ye have not chosen me, but I have chosen you and ordained you, that ye should go and bring forth fruit, and that your fruit should remain. That whatsoever ye shall ask of the Father in my name, he may give it you. These things I command you, that ye love one another. Amen. Well, in the reading at the 17th verse, trusting God has already encouraged us in the reading of his word. Let's pray. Let's seek the Lord. Gracious God, our loving Father, we are before Thee so thankful for the tender mercies we receive from Thy hand. We, we are objects, benefactors of Thy love, and when we think of the Son of God who lived and died for us, how can we ever repay what shall we render to the Lord? We plead, O God, for an increase of appreciation. Whatever our level, whatever our capacity to be thankful is, please increase it. Cause it to overflow. May we swell with gratitude more and more every day. Our time is short. Do teach us to number our days, that we may apply our hearts unto wisdom, even the wisdom found in this passage, to abide in Christ, to have His words abide in us, to love, to keep His commandments, to love one another. Help us, and as we continue here this evening in Thy presence, settle us, give us a sense of Thy nearness, and give us ears circumcised able to hear the Master's voice and to respond. Do save any still lost, we pray in Jesus' name. Amen. A scholar, uh, Daniel Cox, is, well, has suggested, let me just say it this way, has suggested that what we are presently in today, in our current time, is what he has termed a friendship recession, a friendship recession. That looking at the data, looking at all the information that can be gleaned, and of course statistics can be twisted, we get that, but any honest assessment seems to result in the conclusion that things are changing in our world and how we relate to one another, how people interact, how society is fashioned and connected together. And so he has called this a friendship recession. And it's been caused, no doubt, by many things, much of which is really an attack upon God's order for society and a breakdown of doing what he has called us to do. So sometimes this is very deliberate, very intentional. We assault marriage, for example. There's a destruction, purposeful in some cases, of religious communities. and uh, The life of Religion is always under assault, especially Christianity, and these things have consequences. But there are also other things, some things perhaps we don't think about much, uh, more isolated employment environments than in the past, whether that be in the cubicle of an office or some other factor, remote employment, sometimes the, the willingness to travel great distances in order to find employment, breaking connections, breaking friendships and causing them this, this increased isolation. What's interesting and something I was looking at recently is that it seems to be affecting men more than women. So that the statistic is that uh, today 15% of young men say they do not have a close friend, which is compared to 3% in the 1990s. 
So in the space of 30 years or less, there's a five-fold increase in this experience of feeling like you do not have, possess a single close friend. Now we can look at that and say, well, it doesn't really matter. Does, it, does, it, is, does the Lord care about these things? How are we to understand? And, and sometimes, beloved, this is kind of building upon what I said this morning. The focus of our ministry is Christ crucified. The focus of our ministry is, is constantly presenting the personal work of Jesus Christ. But that is, does not mean we ignore some of the uh, foundational and important and vital doctrines that the Bible deals with that are connected to but distinct in certain ways from directly dealing with the personal work of Christ. So, think of the subject of friendship. If I assigned you the opportunity or task of writing a paper on the doctrine of friendship in the Bible, how would that look? The passage we have read shows clearly that our Lord Jesus understands friendship, that this is part of the fabric of our life. And so he says in verse 13, Greater love hath no man than this, that a man lay down his life for his friends. The implication is a man has friends. And he shows that love sometimes in great ways, even to lay down his life. And then he states, Ye are my friends. So the Lord Jesus was not a friendless man. He had friends. There are all sorts of other things that can be concluded from this. This whole passage, if you just look at it in terms of the love, the love that the, the affection that exists, the relationship and fellowship, the sense of what you ask will be done, and all of that in terms of friendship. It can be seen in that light. So that if you actually start thinking about friendship, and what does the Bible say about friendship, this and other passages can be used to develop and mature an understanding of interpersonal relationships, specifically in this area of friendship. So we live in a time, and I don't need to harp on on this, where there is an increase of superficial connections, social media, of course, being uh, the dominant aspect of that, where we can have, you know, 2,000 friends, and yet, do we know any of them? Do we know, do we really know 10%? Do we know 1% really well that we could say these are real friends? And so there's that, not just social media, there's, there's online gaming. There are, you know, for you older folks that may not be aware, there are young people getting together with friends online, and they, whatever the game is, they come together to achieve objectives and video games together with their online friends. Now, I just pause there because touching on that, the what you're going to go away with is twofold. Some of you like look at that and you say, that's ridiculous. Who would do that? Why would you spend your time doing that? And there was a time, I'll, I'll be honest with you, there was a time in which I looked with great disdain upon anything like that. And yet, I think I've come to a point where I realize that everyone's different. Everyone is different. And I look back on my own friendship experience, and I'll tell you, it's, if you're here, and let me just say this as an aside, if you're here, if you've grown up in this church or in a Christian church, and you have developed friendships within the church from youth, and you're still here and with them, and you know them, and you're growing up, that is a huge blessing, because I'll tell you, while I look back and I thank God that He saved me when I was 19, There were years of building friendships in those years prior to that. Years. People I went to school with, people I played soccer with, people I did all sorts of whatever, whatever you do as friends with. And at 19, it ended like that. My conversion ended almost every single one of them. Now, I don't regret that. It had to be done. A couple of years after my conversion, maybe three years or so after my conversion, I happened, and I can't remember even the circumstances of this particular meeting, but I, I bumped into, or was in the presence, of, maybe it was a funeral, it might have been a funeral. Anyway, I was in the car with one of my old friends, 
And for the first time, and perhaps the only one, really, of all my friends that I bumped into after my conversion, he opened up as to what it felt like when God saved me. That's not the words he used. But when I dropped off the map, he said, and I quote, it was like a death. One week you were there, and the next week you were gone. Gone. Now, as I say, it had to happen. I couldn't continue those friendships in the way that I was in them. The objectives of life, the desires, the places we would go to, changed. And so I, I say to you, young people, children, you've developed some friendships. Seek the Lord, and if those other young people seek the Lord as well and live for God, you will have the blessing, and it is a blessing. It is having people who you can grow mature with, who can look back, and you have shared memories going back decades. There's value to that. So when I got converted, it changed everything, all, everything, as I say, totally transformed, and I didn't know it at the time. So what God was doing with me was, was preparing me to be a preacher. I mean, that's, you know, you read the story back, he was preparing me to be a preacher. So part of what that included, and I believe he was doing in my life, was even within the church, there came a period about two years into my conversion where I became even more isolated from people in the church. I'm not necessarily advocating it. I don't know if I got it right. I'm not saying that this is the path for all people. But I do look at it and I think that I think God was just bringing me on to the, the path of the prophet. It's a lonely path. And you have to realize that in ministry, there is a, there is a certain loneliness to ministry. And you have to be okay with it. And I think I was being shaped and molded so that, say, Saturday nights when they were going to 10-pin bowling or whatever, I was in my bedroom with my Bible, seeking the Lord. I look back, and I, is that healthy isolation? I'm not here to advocate it. But in that time, then, I would look at some of the things that other young people would do, and I think, this isn't, this, what, what a waste of time. But I don't think my path is everyone's path. And I've learned and matured and realized that even sitting down and, uh, you know, three or four guys in a room playing, I don't know what it might be, some first-person shooter or whatever it might be, do doing all of that or sharing those experiences and having laughs and so on with it, done in moderation, which is the key, done in moderation, can be used by God. Just like fishing, or like any other thing that someone might do. Some people look at things like, you know, why would you want to fish? <laughs> why would you want to play golf? I used to work with a guy, uh, two men. One of them was really into golf, a handicap of five or so, and the other one used to say, golf is a good walk ruined. And that was his philosophy on golf. <laughs> other people, you just don't, we don't all, sorry Larry, no, no offense there. <laughs> now everybody sees everything the same way. We're all wired differently. But friendship, that's, that's the point. Friendship. Having friends. So I've titled my message tonight, Considerations in a Friendship Recession. Considerations in a Friendship Recession. Coining the term by that professor. And these are just some musings. There's just some musings that I hope may be helpful and maybe even... Uh, a springboard for you to think about this and how important it is to consider the subject of friendship. First of all then, the genesis of friendship. The genesis of friendship. We think of the genesis of friendship. Why is there a friendship? We go back, not just to creation, but we, get, we go back to God. And we say, first of all, it's reflective of a Trinitarian God. It's reflective of a Trinitarian God. Go back to uh, Genesis 1. Genesis chapter 1. Now, I'm not here to, this tonight, argue the case for the Trinity. But as a church, we believe in the Trinity. 
take an orthodox position on the Trinity. And as God is making the world, this Trinitarian God comes to making man, verse 26, God said, let us make man in our image after our likeness. Some have said there's a trinity. Well, not quite. It's not that you can argue the trinity from that perspective, but you can argue for plurality in the Godhead. There's plurality in the Godhead, clearly. There's friendship, as it were, in the Godhead. They're turning, as it were, in commun uh, communing one with the other. Let us make man in our image. And they're all involved in various ways. So that is the genesis of friendship. You see that God has a sense of community within the Trinity and then makes man after his image, which includes then the capacity and the experience and the rightness of friendship. So that man is made in the image of God in such a way that he should expect that there is something that reflects Trinitarian theology in his interpersonal relationships. So, the genesis of friendship is reflective of a Trinitarian God. It's also applicable in a changing world. Applicable in a changing world. And I say this because, first, it's applicable in a perfect existence. It's applicable in a perfect existence. Everything is good in Genesis. God saw, at the end of verse 25, that it was good. Everything is good. Until, of course, we are told that it's not good that man should be alone. So the loneliness of man is not a good thing. It's the only not good thing. Adam is made, and it's not good that he is on his own. So, as you well know, God makes a help that's meet for him in Eve. And that's in a, a perfect world. Adam needed companionship. He needed help. He needed a wife. He needed a spouse to fulfill God's call upon his life. So, while everything's good, this is the one thing that's not good. He gives him a spouse. And what is a spouse but a form of friendship? A form of friendship. It's not the only form of friendship, we know, but it is a form of friendship. And so, even though the world is perfect, there's no sin, there's no death. Man needs a friend. So, it's applicable in a perfect existence. Is also applicable in a fallen existence. Men still need friendship after the fall. Genesis 3, the fall of man, his sin, his rebellion, doesn't take away the need for friendship. Probably in one sense you might say compounds the need for friendship. Because now we're battling with things. Now we're, we're not dealing with a cooperating world. And some of the tasks that we face, the thorns, the briars, all of the effects of the curse, how they're manifested in different things, now it requires at times the pulling together of our collective powers. Now there may have been some aspects of dominion life before the fall that still just the same would have required multiple people, but it certainly becomes a much more a difficult task after the fall, and so joining hands, linking arms, working together becomes even more pertinent, vital. Our Lord Jesus understands that fallen men need a friend. We talk of him as being the friend of sinners. So when we think about dominion, we think about all the task of humanity and the fact that we're faced with a cursed world that works against us by and large, and we see the need for help with one another, 
there's one task we can't face and deal with ourselves. is the task of being godly, having righteousness before God, and fulfilling the ultimate calling, which is likeness to, make man in our image, true likeness to our God. Because as soon as the fall comes, comes the diminishing of that image. It's still there, but it's marred. And with all that man can achieve, even in his fallen condition, the one thing he cannot achieve is to reverse the marring of the image of God in man. It can't be done. And so the Son of God comes. He comes as a friend of sinners. He comes to be a friend to do what sinners cannot do. To live a perfect life of righteousness, to die an atoning death upon the cross, to obtain eternal redemption for us, to satisfy the demands of the Father, to reconcile us to our God and adopt us into the family of God, and to begin anew a renovation of man in his heart and soul, where there is this new man, there is this restoration that is going on in the heart of all of his people which will end, of course, in perfect glory and likeness to Him. So friendship is applicable in a perfect existence, in a fallen existence, also in a redeemed existence. So God saves a sinner. Jesus Christ becomes the friend of sinners. So they have Him as a friend, but He's not our only friend. What does He do? He joins us together with all the members of his body and puts us in a community where we gather together we refer to it the church so that we're not alone giving fellowship friendship forms of friendship expressed through the church so understanding even in our redeemed existence that we we need more than just ourselves and we need more than just ourselves and God he puts us in among people, to work with, live with, encourage, help, support, and do all of the one another's that we find in the New Testament. So, the genesis of friendship. These are some thoughts I hope are helpful for you, reflective of a Trinitarian God, applicable in a changing world, whether it's a perfect existence, fallen existence, redeemed existence. And of course, we're going to go to a glorified existence, aren't we? And it won't be you in your small corner and I in mine <laughs> where we ignore one another. There'll be very much this interconnectedness and interdependence and blessing that is enjoyed without the marring of sin, the effects of sin. We'll be able to look at one another and have no ill thoughts, be able to talk with one another and never be leading astray be able to be assured of the things that we say and all that we hear and there's no sin or deviation from the truth and what's right and light. Secondly, guidelines for friendship. Guidelines for friendship. With all that said, how do we define friendship? The kind of friendship we're talking about tonight. Friendship between different people. Again, there are different forms. We, we talked about it. There's marriage. There's a certain friendship there. There's a certain friendship within all families, friendship within siblings, friendship between parents and their children. I, there is a form of friendship there. I'm not going to say that dads are to say to the kids, you're my friend, in the sense that it's equated with all other forms of friendship. But there, you shouldn't be looking at your kids and say, I am not your friend. <laughs> you know, there's just something wrong there. There's just some kind of friendship that exists between parents and their children, vice versa, and all sorts of other things. There's a biblical dictionary I was reading here, and it gives three components to friendship. Association, loyalty, affection. Association, loyalty, affection. That's what's seen in friendship. And so when you have a real friendship, to some degree, there's a sense of association between those people, some sense of loyalty between those people, and some sense of affection between those people people. Abraham is called friend of God. In some way, he expressed association with God, loyalty to God, and affection for God. Of course, that was reciprocated towards him as well. God associated with Abraham. God was loyal, as it were, to Abraham 
that God showed affection to Abraham. And so there was this friendship that he enjoyed. So what are some guidelines? And look, I, am, I probably could have gone on, like listed more, just so many things here. But when I was thinking about friendship, we were trying to cultivate, encouraging friendship, and I was trying to uh, revive any thoughts of friendship in your mind and help shape them. I think, first of all, motive, the motive for friendship. Why do we have friends? Why does someone want to be our friend? Is the motive always pure? No, we know that. Scripture tells us clearly. Proverbs 14, 20, The poor is hated even of his own neighbor, but the rich hath many friends. And you read that text and you start asking, well, what? what's the motive? Why is it that the poor is hated even of his own neighbor? What's driving that? And what's driving the fact that the rich hath many friends? Are they real friends? Are they Facebook friends? You know, they're dinner party friends who are willing to come for a fancy free meal, but they're not really friends. You start asking the question, what's the motive? What's driving this? Does the rich man really have lots of good friends? Probably not. The motive's all twisted and distorted. Sometimes the rich man himself might look at friendship in a very shallow way where friendships are a foothold to progress in life. So it's a very targeted form of friendship designed to advance another objective, not friendship with the person, but self. So motive. It's right sometimes to look at why someone may be in some way courting a relationship with you, trying to cultivate it, and ask, you know, think to yourself, What's, is, this, is it sincere? I hope we don't always... Impinge wrong motives, that would be wrong, sinful on our part, but it, it's a reality that, that not all friendships are built upon the right motive. Character. Well, let me just go back up to motive. Even just think about it, you know. <laughs> you see this even in, 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 in courting and dating, whatever term you wish to use. There, there can be a wrong motive. There can be a really unhealthy motive. And so we should be aware, as parents and young people themselves, be aware of the motive that even develops a relationship between a young man and a young woman. Character. Character. We think about friendships, we want to think about the character of the, of the people that are in the friendship. What's the character of the people in the friendship? Proverbs warns us of the character of people that we might spend time with, that we might join hands with, and warns us, don't do that. Proverbs 24, verse 1, Be not thou envious against evil men, neither desire to be with them. We are tempted at times to be in the presence of people that we should be nowhere near. The prodigal should not leave the father's home and go and join himself to people that aid in his carnality and worldliness and decline. It was wrong. So don't look at evil men and be envious of them. Desire to be like them or with them. It's always a danger when you see a young person starting to aspire to be in the presence of people who are not good. Not good. You might not say they're evil, but you know they're not good. One family told me not that long ago about the, the guidelines they had concerning their children and the friendships. And of course, friendships span all sorts of, again, levels and depth. And so in the friendship, each friendship was assigned a, a different color of light. There was the green light the amber light and the red light for friendships. I, I, I thought, that's, that's helpful. That's helpful. Is there some people, you, the young person perhaps, they play sport or they're involved in something and they gain friends because they play instruments together or whatever it might be and you know, they're at a chess club or something, but it's not that they're that bad, but they're not good. And so you give it, 
you know, an amber. <laughs> it's like, it's okay in a context, but it's not full green light. It doesn't have all support because there's problems there. They don't know the Lord. They don't love the Lord. They blaspheme. Proverbs 28, verse 4. He that is a companion of riotous men shameth his father. You bring a breach to one more important relationship in order to advance one that is less important and dishonoring to God. A companion of riotous men. Now again, that was a prodigal, wasn't it? A companion of riotous men. Judah did the same. Genesis 38 became a companion of riotous men. To his demise. An angry man stirreth up strife, and a furious man aboundeth in transgression. Again, you're looking at character. Is this person an angry person? Proverbs 29, 22. He abounds in transgression. Is that where you want to be? You want to be in the presence and the company of people who abound in transgression. There's no want or limit to their transgression. So Paul tells us, 1 Corinthians 15, 33, evil communications corrupt good manners. You're going to be affected by this. It's going to affect you. Young people take this to heart. All of us take it to heart, but especially the young, because, you know, you, you do as you age, you get burned. And you, you see the pitfalls and you learn by painful experience. And it leaves its scars and its marks. And the one thing you young people don't have that the older sitting in this room have are the scars of ignoring what God has said. And you either listen to them or you develop your own scars. The danger is it might not just be scars you develop, maybe incurable wounds. And you'll be destroyed forever. You would not be the first. Friends of poor character can cause you to lose things you cannot get back. They are gone. They will take them from you and they will be gone forever. Opportunities. They're inviting you out. Maybe they're a year older than you or they're whatever different stage of life. You're coming up to finals. You're coming up to important exams. GPA is vital. And they're inviting you to go party Go and do this, go and do that. They're encouraging you. I'll oh, forget about it. You'll be fine. You're so smart. You've you passed all, you know, aced all your other exams. You start to slack in the discipline and you say, oh, yeah, you're right. I'll be fine. You start going and then it comes to exam and you're sitting there and you begin to regret that lack of discipline. The grade comes back and the opportunities are gone. Gone. Scholarships and all the rest, gone. And you may never get them back. Jobs, same thing. Heading out, joining with people, getting involved in things, staying up too late, clocking in late, getting fired, losing your job. You would not be the first. Your virginity, once gone, gone forever. Because of the company you keep. Your marriage. Bad company could destroy your marriage. And once, it's, once it's gone, again, most likely to be gone for good. Your health, mental and physical, will destroy it. One thing I have that maybe some of you don't have, I know some of you would, in being saved a little later, being converted a little later and having all those friendships, his ability to look at how life has affected over the last 20 years on the people that I no longer spend time with. Some of them have had a hard road and it's written all over their face. Of course, you look at me and say, it's written all over my hair. <laughs> and that's probably truth in that. But you see, you see it? I have seen lives ruined by a choice of friends. Ruined. Potential gone. Listen to people who care for you. Young people. Listen. Listen. 
We have those little remarks in marriage vows where we invite anyone knows of any impediment, speak now, forever hold your peace. For good reason. Sometimes us older folks, again, who have a little more, and we have the scars and the experience, and we can see things that young people just don't see. And you can stand before them, you can sit down, sit down with them, and you can tell them, hold off, hold off in this relationship, hold off in this wedding, don't progress. Of course, you know what it's like in the months leading up to a wedding and all the rest of it. There's, it's like a freight train moving towards its destination, the date of the wedding. You try to get that train stopped, it's real hard. But if you are ever, I say this again to young people, if you are ever in a position where you are getting romantically more deeply involved, maybe even engaged already, maybe date already set, and someone who respects you, loves you, knows you, you know only wants best for you and understands the circumstances well, sits down before you and says, get off this train. You listen. They're seeing something you probably do not see. Or, or, you're trying to, you're trying to say it's not really there. You're telling yourself, you see it, but you're not willing to Acknowledge it. You think it will change once you're married. You think it, uh, you can fix it, maybe. So motive, character, variety. Well, I deal with a variety as well in terms of friendship. Most of those with friends still want and need a spouse. Such is the way of things. Such is the way God has wired us. We want to have a certain type of friendship. Marriage. And rightly so. And so you should be constantly praying and pursuing. Not carelessly, but proactively. As you get to an age where marriage is certainly something that you can consider, and of course this is part of the danger of the culture that I grew up in and it's probably still prevalent today where people who are not of the age that can be married are getting romantically involved far too early, far too early. <laughs> and they are getting them, they're going to put themselves in real temptation and trouble. So parents, be wise to it. Hold up, limit, shepherd those young people who are not in a position to marry. Be disciplined. Don't, don't, don't be naive to all of their promises to you because they've promised the same to God and they'll break those promises because biology is what it is. And endorphins are what they are. And hormones... There's just no stopping that. Don't be naive. So we should pursue. Pursue that kind of friendship. Those of you who are still waiting and praying, fast and pray. Fast and pray. Seek the Lord. Look around. Keep your eyes open. Talk to good friends. It's a good friendship to have. Whoso findeth a wife findeth a good thing. It's good. But let me say this, just because you're married doesn't mean to say that's the only friend you need. You don't just need your spouse. I, I find that my spouse the best friend I could ever ask for, but at the same time, there are lots of ways, and God, by His design, puts a minister um, along with elders, and there's a friendship that develops there as well, and that's crucial even for the work of God. 
But don't, don't think that all you need you can find, find in a spouse. Keep friendships up. Be, maintain good friendships. I'm talking about wise, lawful friendships. I'm not talking about men spending time with women when you're married to another woman. And you're thinking that, listen, whatever you want to call it, the Billy Graham rule or whatever, it's just wisdom. It's just wisdom. Don't cultivate intimate relationships with people that might jeopardize the most important relationship you have. But there are some spouses that try to prevent or imagine that all we need is each other. Certain truth to that, especially when things are tough, but it's not the wisest approach. Just because you can survive that way doesn't mean to say you should survive that way. And so spouses, let me say to you, if you have an opinion where you kind of cut off a husband cutting off a wife from other good women around her and spending time with them, if you, if you don't give her space to develop and cultivate friendships with other women, I think you're unwise, biblically, biblically and just practically. And the same goes for, for a woman who might look at the man, what would you need to be with your friends? Why would you need to go on a hunting trip with your, you know, whatever? That's a good thing. That's, that's a good thing. There, there's, there's, there's things happening in that environment that are helpful. Challenges maybe he's facing that inwardly he will not address or speak up, but when he's away for a day or two and he's spending time with a, a real confidant that can be trusted, might actually be used of God to bring survival to a marriage that otherwise is struggling. Sometimes the best of friends is a good sibling. If you have it, not everybody has it. Again, partly because of the shared memories and the sense of loyalty. But not everybody has that. Do they? You know, I was thinking about it, thinking about Peter, Peter being called of the Lord along with his brother. And James being called of the Lord along with his brother. That was great. You get to move around and have, have their brothers with them. But I, I also was thinking then, well, when they actually get out and launch into the work, it's Peter and John, not Peter and Andrew. They, they seem to be the, the kind of, the, the, the relationship there between Peter and John is such that they're the pairing that God is using, at least in the record that we have in the Scripture. So some are able to work and enjoy great friendships with siblings, and God uses that, but not everyone. Sometimes friends are found in strange places, and you think of David, and David cannot find friendship among his brothers. They envy him, they have no time for him, they're constantly getting in his way and, and putting false motives upon everything that he does. He can't find a good friend among his brothers. But he finds the best of friends in the son of his arch enemy. Who could have written that? The son of his arch enemy, Jonathan. And their hearts were knit together. The man after God's own heart didn't just need God. He needed Jonathan. And God had him for him. So you may not have godly siblings that you can serve with and work with and consider real friends, but pray for. Think of Paul talking about Timothy. And that was a bit of a different dynamic. But you go to Philippians 2, and he talks about him. I have no man so like-minded. He has in Timothy. There is a friendship there. As different as it may be, but there's something he sees in him. He's, he's just walking. He's, my spirit is in him. Which marks a good point when you think about that, the dynamic between Paul and Timothy. In your friendships, in the variety that I am encouraging here, be prepared to look outside of your normal peer group. Young people, I encourage you. I know nine out of ten of you will not listen to me, but I'm going to say it anyway. Pluck up the courage sometimes to sit in the presence of an older person and talk with them. Ask them. There's some really great ice-breaking questions you can talk to an older person about sitting here in this church. How were you saved? What lessons has God taught you? These are great questions. 
You could build a storehouse that will shape your life, change the directory of your life, guard your heart, and encourage you in your walk with God. Just talking to an old saint. But most of you won't do it. Prove me wrong. Same for you older saints. How hard we fight to live long, don't we? We fight to live long. Pray for good health. Pray that God will spare us. And of course, we know what happens with that. If we are one of the few that are kept and spared a long life, you've been at those funerals. There's no one there, or very few. So, to older folk, cultivate interest in younger people. If you want someone to be there when you write out and you give to your attorney, here's what I want for the order of service of my funeral. You want people to be there to sing those things. Cultivate friendships with younger people. Ask them over for coffee. Spend time with them. Develop a trust between you and them. So friendship is not just among peers or equals. They're superiors who are like mentors and they're inferiors that are considered like disciples. Let me just say this as well, capacity for friendship. Not everyone has the same capacity for friendship. In the sense that some people could have like, you know, they have the capacity to have like 10 best friends, right? And they're constantly in touch with them all, touching their life, going for lunch, spending, like drinking coffee and whatever, constantly. But most of us, that is exhausting. Can't even imagine being able to do that. So there are different capacities. Of course, the introvert just says, I don't have a capacity for friendship, which is not right. Now, Richard Baxter, he gives some guidance. He talks about overmuch friendship. Overmuch friendship engageth us in more duty than we are well able to perform without neglecting our duty to God, the commonwealth, and our own souls. There is some special duty followeth all special acquaintance, but a bosom friend will expect a great deal. You must allow him much of your time and conference upon all occasions. And he looketh that you should be many ways friendly and useful to him as he is or would be to you when, alas, frail men can do but little. Our time is short. Our strength is small. Our estates and faculties are narrow and low. And that time which you must spend with your bosom friend where friendship is not moderated and wisely managed is perhaps taken from God and the public good to which you first owed it especially if you are ma magistrates, ministers, physicians, schoolmasters, or such others as are of public usefulness, end quote. I think there's, there's wisdom there. Baxter understands. That, uh, you know, Baxter was very rigid. Some things he says, you, you, you sort of like, what? <laughs> but I think that you can glean something from it. You can, you can try to cultivate too many friendships that expand your capacity and diminish your fruitfulness. So we all don't have the same capacity. But I say to you introverts who love that idea and say that I don't want any friends and I'm happy to hide away, I say, that's selfishness. Really, that's what it is. It's selfishness. David served his generation. He served his generation. Serve your generation. Invest the time. Make an effort. You will not regret it. You don't need to be outgoing, but you do need to develop the skill of friendship. Then, also generosity. In friendship, there has to be generosity. Generosity of time, affections, possessions. Generosity with forbearance and forgiveness. Can you be generous enough to say faithful are the wounds of a friend? That's generosity. Because a friend loveth at all times. Even when he's saying things that are hard to hear, these are the kind of friends that you need. Of course, if the generosity is all one way and you're trying to fight for a relationship or a friendship and it's just all one-way traffic, that's not a friendship, that's a ministry. If you want friendship, it's always a two-way thing. Finally, the goal of friendship. And time is almost gone, so I'll just touch on this. The goal of friendship. What's the ultimate goal? Well, the glory of God. The glory of God. But let's be more specific. Three things. I'll just leave you with this. Conformity. Conformity. Morris Roberts, godly minister, in an article on friendship, noted this of Andrew Bonner in connection with his friendship with Robert Murray McShane, who of course died at 29. 
He said all his life, and on anniversary occasions especially, he remembered that saintly friend whose presence made God more real and therefore sin more foul. His presence made God more real. That's a good friend. Makes God more real. Can you be that friend to people? Not just being there, but actually bringing God into that relationship so that they feel that God is more real when I'm in your presence? Conformity, companionship. Companionship. That's what you're cultivating, companionship. Walking together. Two are better than one. Developing that over time and enjoying the fruit of it as the years pass. And then commission. Commission. We are given a commission by our Lord to make disciples and every friendship should be aiding us in that, contributing to it. Our Lord Jesus was the best of friends because He enables us to live for the glory of God. He models friendship because He enables us to to pursue our goal. Helps us and never hinders us. That's a true friend. So may the Lord help us. The first friend you need is the Lord Jesus Christ. If you don't have Him as a friend, then you have Him as an enemy. You have Almighty God as your enemy. Wake up. Good things cannot come from having Almighty God as your enemy. You have Him as your friend. Though you may go through times where the entire world forsakes you, and when it feels like you don't have any friend at all, He will be there. But He will also give you companions in each season of life. Especially if there's been an effort to try and cultivate it in all likelihood, though not, I'm making no promises here, because our Lord Jesus invested in a group of men, and when the crunch time came, they all forsook him and fled. So there are no promises. But our Lord never regretted investing that time, did he? And those men did become better men, and eventually did accomplished much and great things for the glory of God because of his investment in them. So may we have the same mentality. The Lord help us and make us people your friends and encourage you to sometimes break out of your little cliques and natural draws and sort of try to pull other people into your life. Especially if you find they don't have a friend. Pull them aside. Encourage them. Be a friend. May the Lord help us. Let's bow together in prayer. Again, let me say to you, if you don't have Christ as your friend, if you have turned your back on the Son of God and rejected His invitation, I appeal to you to consider your ways and try to think soberly about what advantage there is to you in turning your back on the Son of God. Seek Him now. Plead for His mercy. And he will be that friend that sticketh closer than a brother. Gracious God, we are thankful for the friendship of Christ. We're thankful for him modeling friendship and for his interest in people. We're thankful that as he bore our sins upon him and lived out the law of God, it would have been much easier for him to live a monastic life, spend those years in the middle of nowhere, away from a world that despised him and rejected him. But instead he was found in the midst of men, found working and laboring and preaching and ministering to the sons of Adam. Oh, help us to follow in his footsteps and make us friends of those that we can help and give us friends who in turn can help us. Grant that the Spirit of God will lead us and direct us that thou, O God, as thou dost bring to Adam Eve, 
So bring companions and friends to those who need them in this church. Lead and guide. And may we embrace them when they come our way. Help us then. Go with us. Continue to encourage us. May the grace of our Lord Jesus, the love of God our Father, and the fellowship of the Spirit be with all thy people now and evermore. Amen.